Section 27 of The National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27 through 28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses Recent Disclosures Concerning Pre Columbian Voyages to America in the Archives of the Vatican by William Ellroy Curtis. Part 1 Several eminent Scandinavian scholars and others who have made the early voyages of the Norsemen the subject of special study have for years contended that the archives of the Vatican contained important evidence bearing upon the pre-Columbian discoveries of America. Some have even had the courage to assert that the legends and traditions of the Icelandic sagas would be established as facts if the records of the Church could be called as witnesses while others have gone even still farther and have insisted that through the secret aid of the pope columbus enjoyed full knowledge of the voyages of the norsemen and the country they called vinland the good and simply followed the course over which they had cruised across the ocean four hundred years before his birth but until leo the thirteenth came to the vatican no amount of argument or influence was able to unlock the mysterious manuscripts which for eighteen hundred years have been accumulating upon the shelves of the Holy See. Some years ago a woman went to Congress and asked the passage of a resolution directing the President of the United States to use his influence with the Pope to have them examined, but no notice was taken of her petition, and year after year applications from students and historians were made in vain. The officers of the Church denied nothing, they simply said that they did not know what the early archives of the church contained, that they had not been disturbed for centuries, and that no one with access to them had either the time or the disposition to make an examination. In the summer of 1892, Congress passed a resolution requesting the governments of Spain, France, Great Britain, the Pope of Rome, the Duke of Veraguas, and others to loan for exhibition in the convent of La Rabida, at the World's Columbian Exposition, certain manuscripts, maps, and printed volumes relating to the voyages of Columbus and the discovery and early settlement of America. It was my pleasant duty to convey this request to the nations and persons named, and with the exception of the government of France and the municipality of Genoa, the response was prompt, generous, and complete. His Eminence, Manager Rampola, Cardinal Secretary of State, who represented the Pope in the negotiations, was extremely cordial and interested, and although he could not permit any original papers to be taken from the files of the Vatican, he caused a thorough investigation to be made, and furnished a facsimile of every important or interesting document that could be found bearing upon the early history of America. While the claims of the Scandinavian scholars were not sustained, and no evidence was disclosed to show that the discoveries and adventures of the Norsemen in America were ever known to the Church, or that Columbus obtained any information or assistance whatever from this source, there were brought to light several historical documents of the greatest value, relating to the settlement of Greenland, and the propaganda of the church in the Middle Ages. The work of investigation was done under the direction of Mr. J. C. Haywood, a ripe and skillful scholar, who has devoted many years to the study of the history and the policy of the Catholic Church, and who kindly consented to serve as the representative of the Department of State of the United States in securing a historical exhibit from the Vatican. Mr. Haywood was formerly a resident of Philadelphia, but of late years has made his home at Rome, and is one of the chamberlains of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He was inspired in his work by a double motive, the desire to have the Vatican represented at the World's Columbian Exposition by some important and unusual exhibit, and to add to the records of the Department of State at Washington a collection of most valuable historical papers. 
The documents were exhibited in the convent of La Rabida at the World's Columbian Exposition, with the relics of Columbus and the catalogue of the collection contained, among much other new and interesting historical matter. The following description from Mr. Haywood's pen. The facsimile of documents relating to the early history of America here exhibited are taken from the famous series of the papal registers or letter books. These are a collection of more than 12,000 volumes in folio, partly written on parchment and partly on paper, and are preserved in the secret archives of the Holy See at the Vatican Palace. In these registers, almost all the letters issued by the popes were recorded before being sent to their destinations. They contain also the petitions received and offer, therefore, original and most important materials for the histories of all nations. The collection now begins with Pope Innocent III, 1198-1216. to 1216. All the portion of it prior to that date was lost or destroyed in the commencement of the 13th century. What remains is classified as follows. A. The Vatican Registers, over 2,000 volumes, 1198-1600. to 1600. B. The Avignon Registers, about 350 volumes, 1316 to 1417. C. The Lateran Registers, about 2,300 volumes, 1417 to 1831. D. The Registers of the Requests, about 7,400 volumes, 1352 to 1831. It must cause a peculiar satisfaction to Leo the Thirteenth that one of the early results of his enlightened liberality in opening the secret archives is, as shown by these letters, to make accessible to all proofs that, by whomsoever represented, the papacy has always been faithful to the divine mission which it claims for itself, that whenever discoveries of, till then, unknown countries have been announced, it at once has made provision for the preaching of the gospel and the introduction of Christianity among the peoples of such countries. The papers, of which the facsimiles are here shown, may be divided into four groups. Those which relate to the bishopric of Garter, Greenland, those which relate to the line of demarcation, those which relate to the sending of missionaries to America, those in which Pope Julius II recommends Bartholomew and Diego Columbus. A. Documents concerning the bishopric of Garter, Greenland. Greenland certainly is the part of the New World which was first brought into relation with the Old. This was done through the Northmen of Norway and Iceland. It was by their means that Christianity was first carried to America, and there gave occasion for the documents in question. According to Adam of Bremen, died about 1076, and the sagas, Norwegians first reached the American coast at the end of the ninth or beginning of the tenth century, but, as in Norway itself, so in Greenland, the complete establishment of the Christian religion is attributed to King Olaf II, died 1030. It is said that Archbishop Aldebert of Bremen, 1055, sent Albert as the first bishop to Greenland. This bishopric certainly existed in 1124. It was the first bishopric erected in America. The numerous researchers and publications in regard to the extension of settlements which Christian Greenlanders effected on the American continent, and in regard to the positions of the Helleland, the Markland, and the Vinland, make apparent not only the possibility, but also the probability, that a considerable portion of that continent felt in some degree at that time the civilizing influence of the bishops of Garter. Raffin identified the Vindland with Massachusetts. The question has lately been thoroughly re-examined by Storm. His opinion is that Vindland, and consequently the extreme point reached by Christian Northmen, cannot be sought for further south than Nova Scotia. In any case, the historic importance of the bishopric of Garter is plain. The bishopric belonged to the first metropolitan see of Hamburg-Bremen, but in 1146 Pope Eugene III sent the cardinal bishop of Albano Nicholas, who afterward became Pope Hadrian IV, 
to Norway to arrange in a more convenient manner the ecclesiastical affairs of that country. He established a metropolis see at Drontheim, to which he subjected the bishoprics of Norway, of the Northern Islands, and of Garter, or Greenland. The letter of Innocent the Third, the earliest in order of time and the first here exhibited, epitomizes the apostolic case with which his predecessors in the twelfth century had bestowed on only part of America then known. In all ordinary matters the dioceses were governed by the bishops, without any direct interference on the part of the Pope. But when Gregory X, in the Council of Leons, 1174, ordered that a tithe of all ecclesiastical revenues should for six years be contributed, in order to provide means, at least, to preserve the last Christian position in Palestine, which after the death of Louis the Ninth of France, died August the 25th, 1270, seemed almost lost, and some interferences in some cases became necessary. The letters of the popes, written under these extraordinary circumstances to the Archbishop of Trondheim, contain interesting information regarding the condition of the Greenlanders in the 13th century, and show that a part of America helped to furnish the money for the crusade. The archbishop has informed the pope, letters two and six, that it would take him five years, including the voyage to and from, to visit the diocese of Greenland, and has asked permission to send some proper person in his place. Other letters, three and four, say that the archbishop would have to spend six years in order to collect personally the tithes in his archdiocese, and that in doing so he would be obliged to live, sometimes five or more consecutive days, in a tent while traveling through desert regions. Therefore he thinks it needful that a large number of collectors should be appointed. In other letters, five and eight, the archbishop notes the poverty of the country. The people had no money of any kind, and no grain or fruit could be grown. The inhabitants lived on milk or food produced from it, laticenia, and fish. In Greenland, particularly the people could offer nothing for the expenses of the crusade but skins, probably of the elk or of the musk ox, and of seals, coria bovina et focarum, and the teeth and soper of whales, funes balanerum. The non-production of grain and grapes made it necessary for the faithful, letter 7, to provide for a supply of bread and wine to be used in celebrating the Eucharist. From a letter of Pope Nicholas V, dated September 22, 1148, letter 9, it appears that the Greenlanders attributed their conversion to St. Olaf, King of Norway, died 1030, that they had built beside a goodly number of parish churches, a respectable cathedral at Garter, and about the year 1418 heathen foreigners, with a fleet, invaded their country, killed or carried into slavery the inhabitants, and burned their habitations and buildings, leaving only nine churches, which were in the least accessible regions. Some of the captives, having escaped and returned to their own country, unable to go to the distant churches, have begged the Pope to provide them with priests and a bishop. Nicholas therefore empowers the two neighboring bishops of Iceland to satisfy the pious desires of the Greenlanders. The information contained in this letter of Nicholas V is in some measure completed and confirmed by one from Pope Alexander VI, written 1492-93, to just when Columbus had made his great discovery. It seems that the letter of Nicholas did not reach its destination or failed to effect its purpose. At any rate, the Greenlanders had addressed a petition to Innocent the Eighth, setting forth that, for about eighty years, since the heathen invasion in about 1418, they had been deprived of priests and of a bishop. As a consequence, many had already lost their faith, and to those who remained faithful, the only memorial of Christian worship yet belonging was the caporal, on which, nearly one hundred years before, a priest had, for the last time among them, consecrated the blessed sacrament. Once every year this holy and venerated relic was shown to all the people. Before his elevation to the pontificate, Alexander, as chancellor, had proposed Matthew, a Benedictine monk, for the bishop of Garter. 
By this letter he frees him from the payment of all the fees that were due in such cases, and praises the willingness with which he had undertaken the difficult mission. Documents that relate to the line of demarcation. Acting on the approved general opinion, a common consent of the time, which acknowledged the right of popes to interfere authoritatively even in political and international affairs, when the welfare of souls are involved, the Portuguese kings, with their discoveries along the western coast of Africa, commenced a series of demands for the exclusive right of discovery and colonization in that direction. This the popes Martin V, Eugene IV, Nicholas V, and Sextus IV, gradually ceded to them till their successive grants covered all the region from Ceuta, around Africa, to India. The discovery announced by Columbus, and believed even by himself till the day of his death, to be only a new and shorter way to the eastern part of India, naturally excited the apprehensions and jealousy of the Portuguese court. On the return of the great discoverer, March the 4th, 1493, from his first voyage, Ferdinand put in operation all his diplomacy at Lisbon, for the purpose of preventing any interference with his claims, and at Rome, in order to procure from the Pope a sole proprietorship of the New World, he obtained three papal letters, dated May the 3rd and 4th, which was to effect this result. The letter beginning, inter cetera, of the date of May the 3rd, gave to Spain, first the exclusive right to the lately discovered islands, and to the other lands which might still be found, so far as they were not already possessed by some Christian power. Secondly, the same privileges and rights for its new colonies as those previously conceded to Portugal for its possessions on the west coast of Africa. The other letter, of same date, which begins, Eximie Devotionis, contains only the last mentioned concession. The third letter, dated May the 4th, on the other hand, gives the first concession indicated above, but not the second and is therefore to some extent a repetition of the first letter. But it contains, in addition, a definition of the famous line of demarcation, determining more exactly the donation given by the first letter, evidently on account of the grant made to Portugal, although that is not mentioned. The line is fixed one hundred leagues to the west and south of the westernmost islands of the Azores, to the south was added, because the region was particularly desired by both parties, and because Portugal had already proposed the drawing of a line from east to west in order to confine Spain to the northern side of such a boundary. The condition of geographical science at the time did not permit the intended boundary to be defined more accurately. In proposing it to Alexander the Sixth, Spain only knew that it would fall far from San Salvador, and hoped that, by keeping its ships at a distance of one hundred leagues from the most western of the Portuguese possessions, alarm and jealousy on the part of the last-named power might be prevented. But Portugal, like Columbus and Spain, believed San Salvador to be part of India, to which country, passing the Cape of Good Hope in 1487, it had opened a new way, and to which it claimed the exclusive right. It was, therefore, impossible for Spain to maintain the demarcation line of Alexander the Sixth, and in the convention of Todarias, the 7th of June, 1494, it was moved, 170 leagues farther west, a change which, without the cognizance of either party, gave Brazil to Portugal. But although the position of the demarcation line of Alexander the Sixth had been changed, it continued, nevertheless, to be the basis of all subsequent transactions and conventions for dividing the sovereignty of the New World, and thus preserved peace between the two colonizing powers. It is clear from the text of these letters that the popes, and especially Alexander the Sixth, found such action, as was his in this case, on their duty to provide for the Christianization of the new countries a duty which carried with it the right and authority to use all power, and particularly all indispensable means for its accomplishment. The conversion of these heathen populations seemed impossible, unless somehow they should be incorporated into and peace preserved between the Christian kingdoms of Spain and Portugal. The Sending of Bishops and Missionaries to the New World 
In these grants of lands newly discovered or to be discovered, Alexander the Sixth and his predecessors emphatically insisted on the duty of Christian kings to cooperate, by all means under their control, in the conversion of the inhabitants of such lands. In fact, such cooperation was clearly an implied condition and consideration of the grants. The evidence appears insufficient to support a positive assertion that on his first voyage Columbus was accompanied by a priest, but it is a plain fact that for the second expedition, in 1493, Ferdinand and Isabella, as well as Alexander the VI, solicitously provided missionaries not only for the spiritual well-being of the Spaniards, but also, and principally, for the conversion of the natives. Bernard Boyle, greatly esteemed for his saintly life and for his great ability in the management of ecclesiastical and also of political affairs, offered himself for this mission, the first apostle who, after Columbus's discovery, went to the New World. Till 1492 he was a Benedictine monk, or hermit, at Montserrat. But at the time of his mission to the lately discovered islands, that is to say, at least from September 22, 1492, to December 8, 1497, he belonged to the order of the Menemi, which shortly before had been established by St. Francis of Paul. In 1488 he returned to the Benedictine order and became abbot of Cuxa. The copyist of the letter to Alexander IV to Boyle made, therefore, a very excusable mistake in writing Minorum instead of Minimorum, in consequence of which, Regnaldus, Wadding, and many other writers assigned Boyle to the Franciscan order. By this letter of June the 25th, 1493, Alexander granted to Boyle and his twelve companions all the powers and privileges which could aid to make their enterprise successful. Of these twelve companions, only Pedro de Asena and Fray Jorge are named. Pedro de Asena is said to have celebrated the first mass in the New World after it was discovered by Columbus. As early as 1501, at the request of Ferdinand and Isabella, Alexander took steps to provide bishops for the infant colonies in America. In 1504, an archbishopric and two bishoprics were erected at Tagusta, Magua, and Bayuna in Hispaniola, Haiti but through the operations of Ferdinand's well-known financial policy, the plan came to nothing. On August 8, 1511, these three dioceses were suppressed, and three others were established at Santo Domingo and Concepcion de la Vega in Hispaniola and at San Juan in Puerto Rico, and placed under jurisdiction of the archbishops of Seville, where the government of the colonies had its seat. In August and September of 1513, see five letters of that date, John of Quevedo, a Franciscan friar, was appointed to the see of Banta Maria de Antigua, or Darien, and his appointment announced to the authorities and people. He was the first bishop of a diocese on the American continent. He died at Barcelona about December 5, 1520. Already a considerable body of priests, both secular and regular, were working for the religious good of the colonists and to convert the natives. The popes, however, and the rulers of Spain wished to increase the number of these laborers and to provide for their government. A letter of Clement VII, dated June the 7th, 1526, letter 22, the better to effect their wish urged the general of the Franciscans to visit personally the members of his order in the New World. By another letter, letter 23, Clement authorized the emperor, Charles V, who had asked for missionaries, to send 120 Franciscans, 70 Dominicans, and 10 Sergomites to the lately discovered islands, even without the permission of their respective superiors, granting to those who should be sent many privileges and exemptions. With like solicitude, the kings of Spain and Portugal continued to fulfill the condition under which they had received the papal grants of newly discovered or to be discovered territories. Pope Julius II recommends Bartholomew and Diego Columbus to the king of Spain. On the death of Christopher Columbus, May the 20th, 1506, began for his heirs the difficulties which, 
aggregated by the characteristic tenacity of the family, occasioned the endless lawsuit, well known as Los Pletos de Colón. With the hope of ending these difficulties, Bartholomew, the brother, and Diego, the son of the discoverer, determined to join King Ferdinand, then at Naples. Passing through Rome, on their way thither, they were kindly received by Pope Julius II, and obtained from him a recommendation to Ferdinand, who seems already to have been favorably disposed toward them. End of section 27section twenty eight of the national geographic magazine volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org proceedings of the international geographic conference in chicago july twenty seventh through the twenty eighth eighteen ninety three memoirs and addresses Recent Disclosures Concerning Pre-Columbian Voyages to America in the Archives of the Vatican by William Elroy Curtis Part 2 The documents from the secret archives of the Vatican, of which facsimiles were furnished by Cardinal Rampola, for exhibition in the monastery at La Rabida, are as follows. 1. 985 Letter of Pope Innocent the Third, dated February thirteenth, twelve o six, to the Archbishop of Drontheim, confirming his metropolitan rights over the diocese of Greenland, which had been established by Pope Eugene the Third in eleven forty eight. Translation. Innocent the Third to the Archbishop of Drontheim, and his canonically appointed successors in perpetuity. Although the power of binding and loosing was given to all although one and the same command of preaching the gospel to every creature was given to all. Nevertheless, a certain distinction of dignity was decreed, and one alone received above all the rest the care of the Lord's sheep, according to the Lord's words, Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. It was Peter, likewise, who obtained the preeminence among all the apostles. He who received a special command from the Lord to confirm his brethren, in order that posterity might thereby understand that though many should be ordained to govern the church, one alone was to hold the supreme dignity, one alone was to be over all the rest in authority and jurisdiction. Hence, and in accordance with this design, a distinction of dignities is observed in the church, and just as in the human body the different members thereof are destined for different purposes, so also in the church different persons receive different orders for different ministries for some are ordained for special churches some for the government of different cities and the settlement of different affairs others are set over special provinces others have jurisdiction over their brethren for the trial of cases pertaining to their subjects over all these however the roman pontiff like noah in the ark is recognized as holding the first place for he, by virtue of the privilege granted him from on high, in the person of the prince of the apostles, judges, and settles the causes of all, and ceases not to confirm in the Christian faith the sons of the church throughout the world, rightfully endeavoring to prove that he has heard the voice of the Lord, saying, And thou being once converted, confirm thy brethren. The apostles and men who have successfully risen to the government of the apostolic see since the blessed Peter have likewise striven with unfailing zeal to accomplish the same, and either personally or by means of their legates they have endeavored to their utmost to correct whatsoever needed correction and to decree whatsoever was required. Our predecessor of happy memory, Pope Eugene, following in their footsteps, was anxious, in accordance with the duty of his office, to correct in the kingdom of Norway all that seemed to demand correction, by sowing therein the word of faith, and what he himself was unable to do, owing to his care of the universal church, he entrusted for execution to his legate Nicholas, then bishop of Albano, and later Roman pontiff, who, having gone to that country, loaned out, obediently, to the commands of his master, the talent he had received, 
and, like a faithful and wise servant, endeavored to derive an increase therefrom. Among other things which he there accomplished to the glory of God's name, and the credit of his ministry, according as he had been commanded by our aforesaid predecessor, he bestowed the pallium upon thy predecessor John. And lest the province of Norway should lack the supervision of a metropolitan, he designated the city of Nidris, now under thy charge, as the metropolitan see in perpetuity, of the said province, and gave it as suffrage sees in perpetuity. Aslo, Amatrip, Bargen, the Vrangi, and Orkney, Faroe, and Subrai Islands, Iceland, and Greenland, ordering the bishops of the same to obey him and his successors as their metropolitans. Lest, therefore, any one should ever presume to violate the order of the aforesaid legate, we, after the example of the above-mentioned Eugene, of happy memory, of Alexander and of Clement, our predecessors, and Roman pontiffs, confirm the same order by apostolic authority, and by the present ordinance decreeing that, in the city of Nidris, it is to be forever regarded as the metropolitan see of the above-mentioned cities, that their bishops are to obey thee and thy successors as their metropolitan, and to receive from your hands the grace of consecration, that thy successors, however, are to come to the Roman pontiff alone, in order to receive the gift of consecration, and that they are to be subject to the Roman church alone. Moreover, thy fraternity will use the pallium, which has been given thee, the emblem of the plenitude of the pontifical office, within church only during the solemn celebration of Mass, throughout thy entire province, and on those days only which are written below, viz. the Lord's Nativity, the Epiphany, the Lord's Supper, the Resurrection, Ascension, and Pentecost, on the festivals of the Blessed Mother of God, Mary, Ever Virgin, the Feasts of St. Peter and Paul, the Finding and Exaltation of the Holy Cross, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, the Feast of the Blessed John the Evangelist, on the commemoration of all saints when consecrating churches or bishops, blessing abbots or ordaining priests, on the anniversary of the consecration of thine own church, the feasts of the Holy Trinity, and of St. Olaf, and the anniversary of thy consecration. Wherefore let thy fraternity perform all things with such diligence, that the ornaments of thy conduct may be in keeping with the fullness of the great dignity thou hast received. Let thy life be an example to all who are under thee, so that they may learn therefrom that they should seek after what they are obliged to shun. Be distinguished for thy prudence, chaste of thought, pure in conduct, discreet in silence, useful in speech. Seek rather to do good to men than to rule them. In thyself thou shouldest consider not the power of the order, but the equality of thy condition. Have a care lest thy life render void thy teaching, or thy teaching be in contradiction with thy conduct. Remember that the government of souls is the art of arts. Strive above all things to observe faithfully the decrees of the apostolic see, humbly obeying the same as thy mother and mistress. These, most beloved brother in Christ, are some among the many duties which pertain to thy archiepiscopal and sacerdotal office all of which thou canst easily perform with Christ's aid, provided that thou hast charity, which is the mistress of all virtues, and humility, that thou hast inwardly what thou seemest outwardly to have. Accordingly we decree, etc., unto the end. Given in Rome at St. Peter's by the hand of John, Cardinal, Deacon of St. Mary's, in Cosmodin, Chancellor of the Holy Roman Church, on the thirteenth day of February, the sixth indiction, in the Lord's Incarnation, 1205, and the eighth year of the pontificate of Pope Innocent the Third. 2. 986. Four letters from Pope John the Twenty-First to the Archbishop of Drontheim, relative to the collection of tithes in Greenland, for the Crusade, dated December the 4th, 1276. John the Twenty-First to the Archbishop of Drontheim. Having received by apostolic brief the commission to collect tithes in the kingdom of Norway for the Holy Land, 
and having been expressly commanded in the same brief to visit personally all the countries of the said kingdoms for this purpose, thy fraternity informs us that such visitations seem in a measure impossible, for the diocese of Gardar, which belongs to thy province and kingdom, is so far from the metropolitan sea, and the difficulties of navigation are so great, that five years are scarcely sufficient for the round journey. Hence thou hast reason to doubt whether the apostolic mandate, or thine, will reach the aforesaid country within the period named for the payment of the tithes. Accordingly thou hast had recourse to the wisdom of the apostolic see for a remedy in this matter. We therefore, in our desire that the collection of the said tithes be diligently attended to, do wish and by apostolic letters do command thy fraternity, the above facts being true, to appoint certain capable and faithful persons, regarding whom we charge thy conscience, who shall go to that country, and shall see to and diligently superintend the said collection. Thou shalt also zealously provide whatsoever shall seem expedient in the said matter, that thou mayest obtain thy reward of the Lord, and merit for thyself more abundantly the favor of the apostolic see. Given at Verterbo, December the 4th, in the first year. To the same. Having received by apostolic brief the commission to collect tithes in the kingdom of Norway for the Holy Land, and having been expressly commanded in the same brief to visit personally all the countries of the said country for this purpose, thy fraternity has informed us that several of the dioceses in that kingdom, and belonging to thy province, are so widely scattered over the sea, and so extensive in territory, that it would be difficult for thee to visit personally all the districts of the aforesaid diocese within a period of about six years, and without most serious expense to thy see, and since thou wouldst have to travel for some five or more seasons, through countries where, because there are no houses, thou wouldst be compelled to carry tents, thou hast asked to be authorized to depute, notwithstanding the apostolic brief to the contrary, certain prudent and capable commissaries to collect the tithes in the said countries. Wherefore, in order to spare thee and thy see such expense, we have concluded to grant thee, by tenor of these present, permission to appoint such commissaries for the collection of tithes in the said diocese, in case the above be in accordance with the facts, and if thou seest fit to do so, regarding which we charge thy conscience. We wish thee, however, to visit personally such of the aforesaid dioceses as thou canst, without great inconvenience, and to attend zealously to the collection of the said tithes, in order that thou mayest expect a recompense from the Lord, whose work it is, and mayest more abundantly merit the favor of the apostolic see. Given at Vertibo, December the 4th, in the first year. To the same. Thou hast informed us that, owing to the great extent of the diocese in the kingdom of Norway, wherein thou hast been appointed by apostolic letter collector of tithes for the relief of the Holy Land, the two collectors named, with apostolic permission, for every diocese, are not sufficient for the said work, nor can they attend to the matter without inconvenience and very great expense. By the advice and with the assent of thy suffragans in the said kingdom, Thou hast appointed for the country districts of the different dioceses several other collectors, who by their own efforts, and at their personal expense, are to collect the tithes and then consign them to the two city collectors. Wherefore thou hast humbly besought us to consider the labor and expense to which these country collectors put themselves, and to grant them some indulgence. Hence, as we desire that these country collectors should drive some profit from their labors and expense, we grant them the indulgence which has been accorded to those who by their efforts and cooperation further the cause of the Holy Land. Given at Viterbo, December the 4th, in the first year. To the same. Thou hast informed us that in the kingdom of Norway, where thou hast been entrusted with the collection of tithes for the Holy Land, the current coin is so base as to be of no value beyond the frontiers of the kingdom and that in certain parts of the said kingdom money is not used at all. Besides, no crops are grown and no fruits are produced, the people subsisting almost entirely upon milk, cheese, and fish. Hence thou hast humbly asked us to tell thee what thou art to do with the tithes collected 
of the aforesaid milk, cheese, fish, and money. Accordingly, in our desire, that whatever is most advantageous to the work to be done in the matter, we think that it would be well, if the above be exact, to exchange, as circumstances will permit, all such coin and tithes for gold or silver. As for the nuns and other religious orders of the same kingdom, whose incomes and ecclesiastical revenues are so small as to be inadequate for their support, thou canst observe that which is more fully set forth in the declarations concerning this collection of tithes. Given at Viterbo, December the 4th, in the first year. Number 3. Number 987. Letter from Pope Nicholas the Third dated January 31st, 1279, to the Archbishop of Drontheim, concerning the collection of tithes in Greenland. Nicholas III to his venerable brother, the Archbishop of Drontheim. We have gathered from thy letters to us that the island on which the city of Gardar is situated is rarely visited by a ship, because of the storminess of the ocean within which it lies. Hence, when recently certain seamen set sail for the said island to the said city, thou didst avail thyself of the opportunity to send, in company with the said seamen, a prudent man whom thou didst depute to collect the tithes, and relying upon our approval, thou didst authorize him to absolve clerics from the sentence of excommunication, which they had incurred for not having paid the tithes within the appointed time and to free them from whatsoever irregularity they might have contracted. Hence thou hast humbly sought us to grant our gracious ratification. Since then we cannot favorably assent to this demand, inasmuch as it is not supported by reason, and wishing on this account to accede to thy desires by applying a ready preservative against dangers to souls, we hereby authorize thee to impart to those whom thou hast sent or whom thou wilt hereafter send, to the aforesaid island to absolve clerics, whether in the above mentioned, or in whatsoever other islands of the same sea, from the aforesaid sentence according to the form of the church, and to dispense them from this kind of irregularity. Given in Rome, St. Peter's, January 31st, 1279. Number 4. Letter from Pope Nicholas III to Master Bertrand Arnabri, dated June the ninth, twelve seventy nine, concerning the purchase of wine and altar bread for the churches in Greenland. Nicholas the third to the same, Master Bertrand Amabrie. We have lately been informed by thee that certain revenues have been assigned by the piety of the faithful in the cathedral churches of Denmark and Sweden, for the special purpose of procuring wine and altar bread for the clergy of the churches within the said kingdoms. As, however, thou hast consulted the apostolic see as to whether tithes should be taken from such revenues, we, while commending thy diligence, do by apostolic letter leave the matter to thy discretion, so that, if the revenues be so considerable that thou art certain a large sum is left over after the furnishing of wine and altar bread, we desire that tithes be paid thereof. If, however, little or nothing remains of the said revenues, Nothing is to be paid, out of reverence for worship and the sacrament of the Lord. Given in Rome, at St. Peter's, June the ninth, 1279. Number 5. Number 988. Letter of Pope Martin the Fourth to the Archbishop of Drontheim, dated March the fourth, 1281, instructing him as to the skins and whalebone contributed as tithes by the people of Greenland. Martin the Fourth to the Archbishop of Drontheim. Thy fraternity has informed us that the tithes which are being paid in the Iceland and the Faroe Islands in the Kingdom of Norway consist of various articles which cannot easily be exchanged or sold, on which account the same cannot well be sent to the Holy Land or the Apostolic See. Thou hast added, moreover, that the only tithes which can be collected in Greenland consist of skins probably of the elk, or of the musk-ox, or of seals, curia bovina elforcerum, teeth-ropes of whales, funes balnerum, which according to thee can hardly be sold for any suitable price. 
wherefore thou hast asked instructions of the apostolic see as to what thou shouldst do in the premises. Accordingly, whilst we praise thy zealous solicitude, we answer thy question to this effect. Thou wilt endeavor to exchange the tithes of Greenland and aforesaid islands to the best possible advantage, either for silver or gold, and will forward this same as soon as thou canst, together with the other tithes collected in the kingdom for the relief of the Holy Land, faithfully informing as to the nature and amount of what thou sendest. We likewise write to our most dear Son in Christ, the illustrious King of Norway, asking him not to prevent nor to allow any one to prevent the free exportation from his kingdom of the tithes which are to be applied, according as the apostolic see shall see fit, to the relief of the aforesaid Holy Land, and effectually to endeavor to repeal the prohibition decreed against clerics of the said kingdom, forbidding any layman of the same to sell sterlings or other silver. Given at Orvieto, March the 4th, 1281. Number 6. Number 989. Letter from Pope Nicholas V, dated September 20th, 1448, to the Irish bishops at Schalhat and Holar, concerning the condition of the church in Greenland. Nicholas, etc., to our venerable brothers, Bishop at Skalhot, and Bishop of Holar, health, etc. In directing the government of the universal church by virtue of the apostolic charge delivered to us from above, it is our solicitude in God's name to secure the salvation of souls redeemed by the precious blood of our Saviour, not only by calming the storms of impiety and error which sweep over them, but also by sheltering them when exposed to calamities and the whirlwinds of persecution. From the natives and inhabitants of Greenland, an island said to be situated in the most distant parts of the ocean off the northern coast of the Kingdom of Norway, in the province of Drontheim, a mournful wail has reached our ears and sat in our heart. This people nearly six hundred years ago received the faith from the lips of their glorious apostle, the blessed King Olaf and preserved it unchanged and pure, guided by the ordinances of the Holy Roman Church and the Apostolic See. In the lapse of time, burning with a constant devotion, they erected numerous churches and a splendid cathedral, in which divine worship was faithfully carried on, until, thirty years ago, by the permission of him who, in his inscrutable wisdom and knowledge, chastises those whom he loves in order to perfect them, barbarians from the neighboring pagan shores sent a fleet for the invasion of the island the country was devastated with fire and sword sacred temples were destroyed in the whole island which is said to be of vast extent only nine parochial churches were left untouched because they could not easily be reached on account of their situation among the mountains many of the miserable natives of both sexes who seemed able to bear the yoke of perpetual slavery and on account of their physical endurance best fitted for the purposes of their tyrants, were led away by them captives. However, as the same report added, after some time many of them returned to their native shores, and having here and there re-erected what the barbarians had demolished, they desired to spread divine worship and restore it to its former splendor. But past calamities had left them in such a starving and destitute condition that they were without the means of supporting a bishop and priests, and unless, in their desire for religious services, they could undertake a journey of many days to the churches which had escaped the hands of the barbarians, they were for those thirty years in want of the solace of a pastor and the ministry of priests. Accordingly, they have most humbly implored that in our paternal commiseration we would aid them in the gratification of their pious and salutary desire. We would deign to satisfy their spiritual wants and show our benevolence in that of the apostolic see in this matter. Wherefore, moved by the just and lawful petitions and desires of the aforesaid natives and inhabitants of the island of Greenland, and not having certain knowledge of the above facts and their circumstances, we by apostolic letters order one or both of you whom we understand to be of neighboring bishops after having diligently examined and understood what we have said above, to ascertain whether it be true. If this is the state of affairs, 
and if you find the number and resources of the population sufficiently increased to make the expedient and fulfillment of their desire it is our wish that you ordain fitting priests of exemplary life and provide rectors for the government of the restored parishes and churches and for the administration of the sacraments moreover if one or both of you it seemed timely and expedient having asked the advice of the metropolitan if the distance permit we give you power to appoint and constitute as bishop for them some useful and qualified person in communion with us and with the apostolic see to consecrate him in our name with the usual form of the church and to concede to him the administration of spiritual and temporal affairs after having received from him a fitting and customary oath of allegiance to us and the apostolic see making this a matter of conscience we by our apostolic authority concede to one or both of you full and unrestricted power in this matter according to the tenor of these presents all statites all constitutions whether apostolic or of general councils or of any other kind whatsoever notwithstanding given at rome at st potentiana's in the year etc fourteen hundred and eighty eight twelfth day before the calends of october the second year of our pontificate number seven number nine ninety letter of pope alexander the fourth fourteen ninety two to ninety three appointing matthias a monk of st benedict to the bishopric of gardar greenland and describing the condition of the people of that country we are informed that the church of gadar on the confines of the world in the country of greenland whose inhabitants are wont to subsist upon dried fish and milk on account of the dearth of bread wine and oil and that because of the very rare voyages which can be made to the said country owing to the freezing of the waters no ship is supposed to have landed there during the past eighty years we are told, moreover, that such voyages are not considered possible except in the month of August, after the thawing of the ice, and that no resident bishop or priest has governed the said church for some eighty years past. Hence, because of the absence of priests, it has happened that a great many of the inhabitants of that diocese, who were once Catholics, have, alas, denied the sacred baptism they had received it is said that the people of that country have no other reminder of the christian religion than a certain caparal which they show once a year and upon which the body of christ was consecrated by the last resident priest one hundred years ago owing to these and other considerations our predecessor pope innocent the eighth of happy memory wishing to provide an efficient and worthy pastor for the said church which has for so long been deprived of such a consolation in accordance with the advice of his brethren of whom we were one appointed to the said see our venerable brother matthias a professed member of the order of st benedict and now bishop-elect of gades having been precognized at our request previous to our election in his great zeal for the conversion of those who have fallen away and for the expiration of error he now cheerfully resolves to set out upon his most dangerous voyage whilst most highly commending in the lord his pious and laudable intention we wish to assist him somewhat because of his poverty wherefore of our own act cognizance and upon the advice and with the consent of our brethren we command under penalty of excommunication to be incurred ipso facto our beloved sons the copyists abbreviators the solicitors the officials of seals and registrator and all other officials in the respective offices whether of the chancery or the apostolic chamber to forward and to have forwarded promptly and entirely free of charge all apostolic letters concerning the promotion to the aforesaid church of gades which have been sent to the said bishop-elect moreover by the same act with like cognizance and under the same penalties to be incurred by those who disobey and all else to the contrary notwithstanding we order the clerics and notaries of the apostolic chamber to deliver to the said bishops all such briefs and bulls without payment or exaction of any tax or of any of the fees or gratuities usually paid on like occasions 
Let everything be done gratis, in all the offices, because he is very poor, etc. This concludes the series of letters relating to the American continent on the files of the Vatican, dated prior to 1492, and while they furnish presumptive evidence that the existence of the unexplored lands and savage races west of Greenland was known to the Church, they are equally strong proof that Columbus received no information or encouragement from them, particularly as he never expected or desired to discover new lands, but sought a shorter passage to the lands of opulence described by Marco Polo. End of section 28section 29 of the national geographic magazine volume 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org proceedings of the international geographic conference in chicago july 27th through the 28th 1893 memoirs and addresses Recent Disclosures Concerning Pre-Columbian Voyages to America in the Archives of the Vatican by William Elroy Curtis Part 3 The remaining letters from the Vatican files relating to the early history of America are of interest and historical value. Number 8 Number 991 Letter of Pope Alexander the Sixth to Ferdinand and Isabella, dated May the third, fourteen ninety three, congratulating them upon the triumph of Columbus and granting to them full sovereignty over all lands discovered by him. Alexander, etc., to his most dear son and daughter in Christ, the illustrious Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Sicily, and Granada, health, etc. Among the works which are pleasing to the Divine Majesty and dear to our hearts, none is so important as that of the exaltation and diffusion of the Christian religion and Catholic faith, more especially in these our times, the salvation of souls, and the repression and conversion of barbarous nations. Wherefore, when, by favor of God's clemency, and despite our inadequate merits, we were elevated to this holy see of Peter, knowing that you, like true Catholic kings and princes, as we have ever known you to be, and as your famous achievements now prove, not only ardently desire the same end, but strove to attain it with zeal and diligence, allowing yourselves to be deterred by no labors, expenses, dangers, nor even the effusions of your own blood, and being, moreover, aware that you had for a long time dedicated all your thoughts and efforts thereunto, as is shown by the recovery of Granada from the Saracen yoke, accomplished by you in these days, to such great glory of God's name, we with reason concluded to grant you, spontaneously and approvingly, whatsoever would enable you to promote, with ever-increasing zeal for God's glory, and the propagation of Christianity, an aim so holy, so laudable, and so pleasing to the immortal God. We have indeed heard that you, who had long been determined to search for and find certain remote and unknown continents and islands, which no one had ever discovered, in order to convert the natives and inhabitants thereof to the worship of the Redeemer and the profession of the Christian faith, being most earnestly engaged in the conquest and recovery of the said kingdom of Granada, were enabled to carry into execution your holy and laudable resolve. When at length, however, by God's will, the said kingdom had been reconquered by you, in your desire to begin at once the accomplishment of your purpose, sent our beloved son, Christopher Colon, with ships and suitable crews and cargoes, prepared with great labor, risk, and expense, to make diligent search for the said unknown and remote continents and islands in a sea whereon none had ever before sailed. Finally, with the divine assistance, and by the greatest effort, your envoys, while navigating the ocean to the westward, it is reported, in the direction of the Indies, discovered certain most distant islands and continents, also which had never before been found. The inhabitants whereof are numerous and peaceful, and, according to rumor, go naked and eat no meat. 
Moreover, as your said envoys have reason to think, the inhabitants of these islands believe in one God, the Creator, in heaven, and appear sufficiently disposed to embrace the Catholic faith, and to become imbued with good morals, and it is hoped that by means of instruction the name of our Lord Jesus Christ can easily be introduced into the said islands. The said Christopher has already erected a sufficiently fortified citadel, in which he has placed a garrison of his fellow voyagers, who are to search for other distant continents and islands. In those already discovered, gold, spices, and a great number of other precious products of different kinds and qualities are to be found. Wherefore you, on diligent consideration of all these facts, being, like your great and royal ancestors, as becomes Catholic kings and princes, most of all concerned with the exaltation and diffusion of the Catholic faith, have resolved with God's merciful assistance to subdue the aforesaid countries and to convert their inhabitants to the Catholic faith. Hence, whilst we most highly commend in the Lord your holy and laudable purpose and desire that it may be duly accomplished, and by this means our Saviour's name be made known in those countries, we most earnestly exhort you in the Lord and demand of you, in virtue, of holy baptism, by whose reception you have bound yourselves to obey our apostolic orders, and through the bowels of the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, inasmuch as you intend all of your own free will, and out of zeal for the orthodox faith to undertake this expedition, you will diligently, and out of a sense of duty, induce the inhabitants of the said countries to embrace the Christian religion. We moreover exhort you not to allow yourselves to be deterred by dangers or trials, and to remain firm in the hope that Almighty God will prosper your efforts, and in order that you may the more willingly and courageously set about so great an undertaking, after having received of the abundance of apostolic bounty by our own act, without being moved thereunto by any petition presented to us by you or by another in your behalf, but out of our sheer liberality, with certain cognizance, out of the fullness of apostolic power by the authority of Almighty God given us in blessed Peter, and of the vicegerency of Jesus Christ which we exercise upon earth by tenor of these presents, give, grant, and assign in perpetuity to you and your heirs and successors, the kings of Castile and Leon, all the aforesaid unknown continents and islands that have been or shall hereafter be discovered by your envoys which are not actually under the temporal dominion of any Christian prince, together with all their territories, cities, castles, towns, and villages, all their rights, jurisdictions, and possessions. We moreover create, constitute, and appoint you and your heirs and successors aforesaid lords of the same, with full, free, and universal authority. We decree, however, that by this our grant, donation, and assignment, no acquired right of any Christian ruler is to be understood as taken away, nor is it to be taken away. We moreover command you, in virtue of holy obedience, according to your promise which we feel certain you, in your great devotion and royal magnanimity, will fulfill, to appoint with all due diligence virtuous, God-fearing, learned, experienced, and tried men, who shall instruct the natives of the aforesaid islands in the Catholic faith, and imbue them with good morals. Moreover, we strictly forbid, under penalty of excommunication, to be incurred in the act of disobedience, all persons of whatsoever rank, be it even imperial or royal, state, degree, order or condition, to presume to go, whether for the purpose of trade or for any other whatsoever, to the aforesaid islands and continents, after they have been discovered by your envoys, or by those sent for the purpose by you without your special permission and that of your aforesaid heirs and successors and inasmuch as certain kings of portugal have also by an apostolic grant made to them discovered and acquired other islands in the countries of africa guinea and the gold coast have been accorded different privileges favors liberties immunities exemptions and indults we wish you to use possess and enjoy all and every one of the same favors, privileges, exemptions, liberties, faculties, immunities, and indults, all whose tenors we desire to be considered as though inserted word for word in the present letter, 
and to be regarded as sufficiently expressed and inserted in the same, just as if they had been granted to you and your heirs and successors by the same act, authority, knowledge, and fullness of apostolic power, and by special gift of favor. We extend and give the same in all respects to you, your heirs and successors aforesaid, notwithstanding apostolic constitutions and orders, and all which has been granted in the above letters, and all else whatsoever to the contrary, trusting in him from whom empires, governments, and all good things come that under his guidance of your actions, your labors, and endeavors will soon reach a most happy result, to the joy and glory of all Christendom. If you do but continue in this holy and praiseworthy resolve, enterprise. Since, however, it would be difficult to send the present letter to all those places in which it would be expedient to have it published, we wish, and by the same act, and with like cognizance, we decree that the same be copied by a public notary, thereunto deputed and sealed by some ecclesiastical dignitary, and that the same value be attended to the said copies, whether in or wherever else soever out of court, as attaches to the present original, should they be shown or exhibited. No one shall go counter to our exhortation, requisition, donation, grant, assignment, investiture, act, constitution, deputation, order, inhibition, indult, exemption, gift, will, and decree, etc., whosoever, etc., given in Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year, etc., 1493, 3rd of May, in the first year of our pontificate. Col A. de Compania, N. Casanova. By order gratis, B. Capocci, D. Sorano. Number 9. Number 992. Letter of Pope Alexander the Sixth to Ferdinand and Isabella, dated May the 3rd, 1493, granting them sovereignty over all unknown continents and islands in the Indies that may be discovered by the explorers of Spain, and confining to Portugal the newly discovered lands of Africa. Alexander, etc., to his most dear son and daughter in Christ, the illustrious Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Castile, Leon, Aragon, and Granada, health, etc., the sincere and extraordinary devotion, and the perfect faith with which you honor us, and the Roman Church, truly deserve that we approvingly grant you whatsoever may enable you to promote more speedily and effectually your holy and laudable undertaking of discovering remote and unknown continents, and islands for the glory of Almighty God, the extension of Christ's dominion, and the exaltation of the Catholic faith. Accordingly, by your own act, with full cognizance, and in virtue of the plenitude of apostolic authority, we have this day given, granted, and assigned to you and your heirs and successors, the sovereigns of Castile and Leon, in perpetuity, as is more fully set forth in our letter on this subject, all and every one of the remote and unknown continents and islands lying towards the west and the ocean, and not at present under the temporal authority of any Christian princes, which have been or shall be discovered by yourselves or your envoys, who have been equipped for the purpose of great pains, risks, and expense. We have included in the same donation all the states of the aforesaid continents, and their islands, their cities, castles, towns, and villages, rights, and all jurisdictions whatsoever. As, however, on another occasion, different privileges, favors, liberties, immunities, exemptions, faculties, briefs, and indults, were granted by the apostolic see to certain kings of Portugal, who, after obtaining a like apostolic donation, discovered and acquired other islands in the regions of Africa, Guinea, and the Gold Coast. We also, wishing, as is proper, to bestow equal favors, prerogatives, and benefits upon you and your heirs and successors aforesaid, by a similar act, without being moved thereunto by any petition presented to us by yourselves or another in your behalf, but out of sheer liberality, with like cognizance and fullness of apostolic power, by apostolic authority, and by gift of special favor, do hereby grant you and your heirs and successors aforesaid the free and legitimate exercise, possession and enjoyment in the islands and countries thus far discovered, or that shall hereafter be discovered by yourselves, or in your names, of all the favors, liberties, privileges, exemptions, faculties, immunities, briefs, 
and indults which have been accorded to the kings of Portugal. We desire that the tenors of all the aforesaid concessions be considered as inserted word for word in the present letter, and as sufficiently inserted and expressed to signify that the said favors are specially granted to you and your heirs and successors aforesaid. In like matter and form, we give in perpetuity all the above to you and your heirs and successors aforesaid, apostolic decrees and ordinances, and all of a similar nature that is contained in the letters to the kings of Portugal, to the contrary notwithstanding, etc., given in Rome at St. Peter's, May 3rd, 1493, in the first year of our pontificate. Number 10. Number 995. Bull of the Pope Alexander the Sixth, dated May the 12th, 1493, establishing the line of demarcation between the dominions of Spain and Portugal. Alexander, etc., to his most dear son and daughter in Christ, the illustrious Ferdinand and Isabella, king and queen of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Sicily, and Granada, health, etc. Among those works which are pleasing to the divine majesty and dear to our heart, none is so important as that of the exaltation and diffusion of the Christian religion and Catholic faith, more especially during our times, the salvation of souls, and the repression and conversion of the barbarous nations. Wherefore, when by favor of God's clemency, and despite our own inadequate merits, we were elevated to this holy see of Peter, knowing that you, like true Catholic kings and princes, as we have ever known you to be, and as your most famous achievements now prove, not only ardently desired the same end, but strove to attain it with zeal and diligence, allowing yourselves to be deterred by no labors, expenses, dangers, nor even by effusion of your own blood, and knowing, moreover, that you had for a long time dedicated all your thoughts and efforts thereunto, as is shown by the recovery of Granada from the Saracen yoke, brought about by you in these days to such great glory of God's name, we with reason concluded to grant you spontaneously and approvingly whatsoever would enable you to promote with ever-increasing zeal for God's glory and the propagation of Christianity, an aim so holy, so laudable, and so pleasing to the immortal God. We have, indeed, heard that you, who had long been determined to search for and find certain remote and unknown continents and islands, which no one had ever discovered, in order to convert the natives and inhabitants thereof to the worship of the Redeemer and the profession of the Christian faith, being most earnestly engaged in the reduction and recovery of the said kingdom of Granada, were unable to carry into execution your holy and laudable resolve. When at length, however, by God's will, the said kingdom had been reconquered, you, in your desire to begin at once the accomplishment of your purpose, sent our beloved son, Christopher Colon, a worthy and most commendable man, and well fitted for so great an undertaking, with ships and suitable crews and cargoes, prepared with great labor, risk, and expense, to make diligent search for the said remote and unknown continents and islands in a sea whereon none had ever before sailed. Finally, with the divine assistance and by dint of the greatest care, your envoys, while navigating the ocean, discovered certain most distant islands and continents also, which had never before been found. The inhabitants whereof are numerous and peaceful, and, according to report, go naked and eat no meat. Moreover, as your said envoys have reason to think, the inhabitants of these islands believe in one God, the Creator in heaven, and appear sufficiently disposed to embrace the Catholic faith, and to become imbued with good morals, and it is hoped that by means of instruction the name of our Lord Jesus Christ can be easily introduced into the said islands. The said Christopher has already erected a sufficiently fortified citadel, in which he has placed a garrison of his fellow voyagers, who are to search for other distant continents and islands. In those already discovered, gold, spices, and a great number of other precious products of different kinds and qualities are to be found. Wherefore you, after diligently considering all these facts, being like your great and royal ancestors, as becomes Catholic kings and princes, most of all concerned with the exaltation and the diffusion of the Catholic faith, have resolved with God's merciful assistance to subdue the aforesaid countries and to convert their inhabitants to the Catholic faith. 
Hence, whilst we most highly commend in the Lord your holy and laudable purpose and desire that it be duly accomplished, and that by this means our Saviour's name be made known in those countries, we most earnestly exhort you in the Lord, and demand of you in virtue of holy baptism, by whose reception you have bound yourselves to obey our apostolic orders, and through the bowels of the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that inasmuch as you intend of your own free will and out of zeal for the orthodox faith to undertake this expedition, you will diligently and out of a sense of duty induce the inhabitants of the said countries to embrace the Christian religion. We moreover exhort you not to allow yourselves to be deterred by dangers or trials, and to remain firm in the hope that Almighty God will prosper your endeavors. And in order that you may the more willingly and courageously set about so great an undertaking, after having received of the abundance of apostolic bounty by our own act, without being moved thereunto by any petition presented to us by you or by another in your behalf, but out of our sheer liberality, with certain cognizance, out of the fullness of apostolic power, by the authority of Almighty God given us in blessed Peter, and of the visurgerency of Christ, which we exercise upon earth, we by tenor of these presents give, grant, and assign in perpetuity to you and your heirs and successors, the kings of Castile and Leon, all the islands and continents that have been or shall be found and discovered westward and southward in a line drawn from the Arctic Pole or the north to the Antarctic Pole or the south, whether these continents or islands that have been or shall be found lie in the direction of India or in any other country, the said line to be one hundred leagues distant to the west and south from the most western and the most southern of the islands commonly called the Azores and Cape Verde. That is to say, all the islands that have been or shall be discovered west or south of the aforesaid line, which were not actually owned by any other Christian king or prince prior to the last feast of the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, from which the present year, 1493, began at the time when some of the aforesaid islands were discovered by your envoys and captains, together with all their territories, cities, castles, towns, and villages, all their rights, jurisdictions, and possessions. We moreover create, constitute, and appoint you and your heirs and successors aforesaid lords of the same, with full, free, and universal authority. We decree, however, that by this our grant, donation, and assignment, no acquired right of any Christian ruler, who was in actual possession of any of the said islands prior to the above-mentioned feast of the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, is to be understood as taken away, nor is it to be taken away. We moreover command you, in virtue of holy obedience, according to your promise, which we feel certain that you in your royal devotion and royal magnanimity will fulfill, to appoint with all due diligence virtuous, God-fearing, learned, experienced, and well-tried men, who shall instruct the natives of the aforesaid islands in the Catholic faith, and imbue them with good morals. Moreover, we strictly forbid, under penalty of excommunication, to be incurred in the act of disobedience all persons of whatsoever rank, be it even imperial or royal, state, decree, order or condition, to presume to go, whether for the purpose of trade, or for any other whatsoever, to the continents or islands that have been and shall be discovered to the west and south of a line drawn from the north to the south poles, whether in the direction of India or of any other country, the said line to be one hundred leagues distant to the west and south from the most western and the most southern islands of these commonly called the Azores and Cape Verde, as has already been set forth, without the special permission of yourselves and your aforesaid heirs and successors, apostolic constitutions and decrees, and all else to the contrary notwithstanding. We trust in him from whom empires, governments, and all good things proceed, that if you persevere in this your holy and laudable purpose, your labors and endeavors will, under the divine guidance, be speedily crowned with a most fruitful result, to the joy and glory of all Christendom, etc. Given in Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year of the Lord's Incarnation, 1493, May the twelfth, in the first year of our pontificate. Number 11. Number 996. Bull of Pope Alexander the Sixth. Dated Rome, June twenty fifth, fourteen ninety three, confirming Bernard Boyle as the first missionary to the New World. 
Alexander, etc., to our beloved son Bernard Boyle, friar of the Order of the Miners, and vicar of the said order in the kingdom of Spain, health, etc. By virtue of the apostolic authority, with certain cognizance, and by tenor of these presents, we grant to thee, who art a priest, full, free, and universal faculty, permission, power, and authority, and the same to any members of thine own or another order, to be selected by thyself or by the queen and king, viz. Ferdinand and Isabella, without any necessity of permission unto this end, from thy superiors or from any others whatsoever, to go to the aforesaid islands and countries, and to reside therein at your pleasure, to preach and sow the word of God, of thyself or by means of another or other suitable priests, whether secular or regular, and of whatsoever orders, to bring into the Catholic faith the said natives and inhabitants, to baptize and instruct them in that faith, and to administer to them as often as necessary the sacraments of the church, to hear them, one and all, in their confessions, whenever requisite, either in person or by means of another, or other priests, whether secular or regular, and, after having carefully heard them, to grant them the required absolution for their crimes, excesses, and transgressions, even from such as may demand consultation of the apostolic see, in any wise whatsoever, and enjoin them upon their salutary penance, to commute to other works of piety all their temporal vows, excepting only those of pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the tombs of the apostles of Peter and Paul, St. James of Compostela, and the vows of religion, to be found and erect, provided nobody's right be infringed upon thereby, any churches whatsoever, chapels, monasteries, houses of any religious orders whatsoever, even of mendicant orders, whether for men or women, holy places with belfries, bells, dormitories, cloisters, refectories, orchards, gardens, and any other necessary adjuncts, to receive into houses of the professed of mendicant orders erected by thee for the same and to grant permission to dwell permanently therein to bless the said churches and as often as they and their respective cemeteries chance to be desecrated whether by the shedding of blood pollution or otherwise to bless and rededicate them through any catholic priest after the customary manner to eat freely and lawfully and as often as necessary meats and other kinds of food that are forbidden thee and thy associates by the rules of the said orders, with regard to which matter we charge your consciences, and to execute and dispose all things, and everything, in the above, and all things necessary thereto. Moreover, in order that the faithful may the more willingly go to those countries and islands out of devotion, and in the hopes of securing the salvation of their souls, we grant to all and every one of the aforesaid faithful, of either sex, who personally go to the aforesaid countries and islands by order and with consent, however, of the above-mentioned king and queen, the choice of a suitable confessor, either secular or regular, who shall have power to absolve them, all or any one of them, after the manner above stated, from their crimes, transgressions, and even such sins as are reserved to the said see, to commute their vows, and to impart to them, in virtue of the aforesaid authority, once in life and at the hour of death, indulgence and remission of all their sins, for which they shall be heartily sorry, and which they shall have orally confessed, continuing steadfastly in the sincerity of faith, in union with the Holy Roman Church, and in obedience and fealty to us and to the Roman pontiffs, our legitimate successors. We also grant to the monasteries, establishments, and houses, which may be founded, and to the monks, brethren, and temporary sojourners therein, the full and lawful exercise, possession, and benefit of all and every one of the favors, privileges, liberties, exemptions, immunities, indulgences, and concessions which have been given in general, or which may hereafter be given to the monasteries, establishments, houses, and to the monks and brethren of the orders to which the aforesaid places and persons belong. We bestow the above as a mark of special favor, notwithstanding the decrees of our predecessor of happy memory, Pope Boniface the Eighth, forbidding mendicant friars to accept new houses without special permission of the said see, etc. Given at Rome from St. Peter's, in the year 1493, June the 25th, in the first year of our pontificate. Number 12. Number 997. Pope Julius the Second commends Bartholomew, 
the brother, and Diego, the son of Columbus, to the favor of King Ferdinand, dated April the 10th, 1507. Our most dear son in Christ, health, etc. Our beloved son, Bartholomew Colon, the brother of Christopher, who of late years discovered those islands of India who were unknown to our forefathers, being on his way to see your majesty, tarried with us in order to show his devotion to our person. We kindly received him and heard him because of his long sojourn in those islands. We were, moreover, pleased to give him our recommendation inasmuch as Christian governments appear to have greatly profited by the discovery of the said islands. Wherefore we beseech your majesty, whose aim and desire has ever been the good of the Catholic faith, to consider Bartholomew himself and his nephew, the admiral of the said islands, as most highly recommended, though we are of the opinion that you will do this of your own accord. Given at Rome, April the 10th, 1507, in the fourth year of our pontificate. Number 13. Number 998. Bull of Pope Leo X, August the 28th, 1513, appointing John of Quevedos of Santa Maria de Antigua, Darien, the first bishop on the American continent, also letters to the people of that diocese, and to Queen Johanna of Spain. Leo X, to our beloved son, John of Quevedos, elect of Santa Maria de la Antigua, health, etc. The debt of our pastoral office requires that amidst the diverse cares by which we are constantly harassed, this above all should occupy our attention, that over all churches, and especially those which, like young plants budding forth in the garden of the Lord, are most exposed to the misfortunes of vacancy, by our diligence those pastors be appointed, through whose fruitful care the same churches may, with the Lord's help, be able to receive a happy increase in spiritual and temporal affairs. A short time ago we reserved to our appointment and disposal provisions for all churches which were then vacant, or which from that time forward should become vacant, declaring thenceforth null and void all attempts made to the contrary, no matter by whom or by what authority, whether designedly or not. Afterwards, however, the church at Santa Maria de la Antigua became vacant, which we to-day, counseled by our venerable brothers, and in the plenitude of our apostolic power, have erected in that newly discovered land of primeval India, liberated from pagan tyranny under the auspices of our beloved son in Christ, Ferdinand, illustrious king of Aragon and both Sicilies. We then, to provide quickly and happily for the same church, concerning which none but us could or can provide on account of our reservation, and decree to the contrary with paternal and solicitous care, carefully deliberated with our venerable brothers regarding the choice of a useful and zealous person to place over the same church, lest it be subjected to the ravages of a long vacancy. And finally, we directed to our mind's eye to you, a priest and professed member of the orders of Friars Minor, known as Observants, you of whose zeal for religion, literary requirements, purity of life, regularity of morals, providence in spiritual and circumspection in temporal affairs, and many other virtuous gifts suitable to testimony has been given, all which things having been duly considered by the counsel of the same brothers, we, the aforesaid authority, make provision for that church in your person, you who for your merits have proved acceptable to them, and to us, and we appoint you its bishop and pastor, committing entirely to you its care and the administration of its spiritual and temporal matters, and confiding in the giver of mercies, we hope that God, directing your actions, that church, under your wise and happy government, may with the help of God's grace be usefully and prosperously ruled and receive a gratifying increase in temporal and spiritual affairs. Receive then with alacrity the yoke of the Lord which we place upon your shoulders, Strive to care for and administer that church with such fidelity, solicitude, and prudence that it may rejoice in being committed to so provident and profitable an administration, and that you, besides a reward in eternity, may merit henceforth more abundant blessings and grace from us and the apostolic see. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year of the Incarnation of our Lord, 1513, the fifth day before the Ides of September, the first year of our pontificate. 
In like manner to our beloved children, the people of the city, and the diocese of the Church of Santa Maria de la Antigua, health, etc. Today, advised by our brothers, and in the fullness of our apostolic authority, we provide for the Church of Santa Maria de la Antigua in the islands of India, which has been vacant since its first erection, in the person of our beloved John, elect of Santa Maria de la Antigua, acceptable to us and to our brothers for his merits, and we appoint him bishop and pastor of the same, committing entirely to him its care and administration in spiritual and temporal matters, according as is more fully expressed in our letters written to this effect. Wherefore, we earnestly ask and exhort you all, we order you by apostolic letters to receive the same John, elect as your father and pastor of your souls, with grateful honor, to pay him devout and fitting reverence, humbly to obey his salutary admonitions and commands, so that he may rejoice to have found in you dutiful sons, and you in consequence to have found him a benevolent father. Given as above. In the same manner, to our beloved daughter in Christ, Johanna, illustrious Queen of Castile and Leon, health, etc., grace, etc., since then, beloved daughter in Christ, it is the work of virtue to act with benign favor towards the ministers of God, and to revere them by word and deed for the glory of the eternal King. We earnestly request and exhort your royal serenity, out of love for us and the apostolic see, to consider the same John, elect, and his church of Santa Maria de la Antigua, as most heartily commended, etc., given as above. Number 14. Letters from Pope Leo, granting authority for the confirmation of John of Quevados as Bishop of Darien. 1020, 14, De Campania. Leo X, to our beloved son John of Quevados, elect of Santa Maria de la Antigua, health, etc. Since we, by apostolic authority, counseled by our brothers, have thought it proper to provide for the Church of Santa Maria de la Antigua, in a certain manner bereft of the solace of a pastor, in your person acceptable to us, and to our brothers, as your merits require, appointing you its bishop and pastor, according as is contained more fully in our letter written for that reason, graciously attending to what may be your greater convenience, we grant your request, conceding to you full and free leave, according to the tenor of these presents, to receive consecration at the hands of whatsoever Catholic bishop you wish, in favor and communion, we grant to the same bishop leave by our authority, freely and lawfully, to perform the aforesaid function, after having received from you, in our name, and that of the Roman Church, the usual oath of fidelity, according to the form indicated by these presents. However, we wish, and by the aforesaid authority, command and decree, that if the same bishop presume to confer on you that charge, without having received from you the aforesaid oath, and if you dare to accept it, that bishop be suspended from the exercise of his pontifical office, and both he and you be suspended, by that very fact, from the administration of your churches, in both spiritual and temporal matters. We desire, moreover, that you see to it that the form of this oath be taken by you, be sent to us as soon as possible, through your own nuncio, word for word, by your letters, patent signed with your own seal. This is the form of the oath which you will take. I, John, elect of Santa Maria de la Antigua, from this hour henceforth will be faithful and obedient to blessed Peter and the Holy Roman Church, and to our Lord Pope Leo X, and his successors canonically constituted, so help me God and these his holy gospel. Given at Rome at St. Peter's in the year of the incarnation of our Lord, 1513 the fourth day before the Ides of September, in the first year, 1020, de Campania. Number 15. Letter from Pope Leo X, granting absolution to John of Quevedos, Bishop of Darien. To our beloved son, John of Quevedos, professed member of the Order of Friars Minor, known as Observance, Health, etc., the customary clemency of the apostolic see employs opportune remedies, according as is fitting, in order that the disposition made by it, for the time being, regarding cathedral churches, may not meet with opposition, but that the persons to be placed over them 
may be able to preside over the same with pure heart and sincere conscience. Whereas, then, we this day, with the advice of our brothers, provide in your person acceptable to us and to our brothers, as your merits require, for the Church of Santa Maria de Antigua, which, vacant from its early erection, still now we by apostolic authority, and counseled by the same brothers, have this day erected, and whereas we intend to place you over it as its bishop and pastor, desiring that this provision and appointment meet with no opposition on account of any ecclesiastical sentences or censures which you may have been under. We, according to the tenor of these presents, by apostolic authority, do absolve you, and do declare you absolved henceforth from any excommunication, suspension, etc., to this end only that the aforesaid provision and appointment and all the apostolic letters written above obtain their effect, notwithstanding apostolic constitutions and ordinations, and whatsoever others to the contrary, no one therefore to infringe on our absolution and declaration, etc., if any one, etc. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year of the incarnation of our Lord, 1513, the day before the fifth day before the calends of september one thousand twenty de campania number sixteen number one thousand and two letter from pope clement the seventh dated rome june seventh fifteen twenty six to friar francisco de los angeles minister general of the order of saint francis bestowing upon him the apostolic benediction upon his departure for america Clement the Seventh to Brother Francis of the Angels, Minister General of the Order of St. Francis, Beloved Son, etc. In our recent conversations with you, we had the occasion to admire your spirit of religion and sanctity, your learning and prudence, and your zeal for the honor of God and His worship, and we are of opinion that such dispositions on your part fully deserve our paternal love and favor. Being Minister General of the Order of St. Francis, because of your virtues and services to religion you desire to see the christian faith preached and propagated in the new world among the nations of those countries recently discovered by our most dear son in christ charles emperor elect of the spains etc and catholic king not content with having sent your brethren and religions to those new nations you wish to go to them in person and like god's holy apostle devote your whole strength to infusing into their minds the truth of the gospel and extending the limits of christendom to those distant regions by means of the most holy sign of the cross you are now preparing yourself for your apostolic and are on the point of taking your departure we pray god to bless your holy dispositions and the zeal which impels you to so salutary a work upon which we congratulate you exceedingly we exhort you to persevere with hope and confidence in this undertaking, which you have chosen to direct in person. We pray, Almighty God, who inspires you with so much zeal, to aid you with his heavenly light, that you may the more easily induce those nations, now lying in darkness, to accept the truth. We give you our apostolic benediction, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. After the examples of Jesus Christ our Saviour, we send you, as he sent his apostles, to conquer for heaven, which will be your reward, those countries and nations, in the name of the same, Jesus Christ our Lord. Given at Rome, the 7th of June, 1526, in the third year of our pontificate. Number 17. Number 1003. Letter from Pope Clement the Seventh to Charles V of Spain, dated October the 19th, 1532, authorizing missionaries to be sent to America. To our dearest son in Christ, Charles, ever August Emperor of the Romans, our dearest son in Christ, health, etc., you have recently made known to us that by the blessing of the Lord you have subjected to your authority some other islands of the new world, and a savage people living therein unacquainted with the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, and the orthodox faith, and that, unable to provide for the salvation of the souls of the natives, and to procure their instruction in the faith, you desire that there be appointed some professed members of an approved religious body, who shall preach and make known the word of God in these islands, and direct and guide the natives in the way of the Lord's commandments. 
Accordingly, in God's name, we most heartily approve your pious desire, and in plenitude of our apostolic authority, grant you by these presents full and unrestricted power to assign for this work 120 minorities of the order of preachers, and 10 professed Geronimites, whom you, beloved son, or your representatives in those islands shall ascertain to be qualified for the undertaking and willing to assume it. We grant, moreover, to those professed religions liberty to repair thither even without having asked or obtained the permission of their superiors, to preach there the word of God, and for this purpose to reside there, living, however, in a manner becoming the religious and wearing the habit of their order. It is also our wish that these religions have free and lawful possession, use and enjoyment of each, and every one of the privileges, immunities, exemptions, prerogatives, favors, and indults, which other members of the same order, dwelling in their own houses and monasteries, possess, use and enjoy by law, custom, or any other title. And this we concede, notwithstanding constitutions and provisions of the apostolic see, statutes of the aforesaid orders confirmed by oath, apostolic letters to these orders and to their superiors, prelates and members, no matter of what tenor they may be, what form they may have, and what clauses or decrees they may be furnished with, even if granted freely and spontaneously, with certain knowledge, and in the form of a brief and though conceded repeated times, approved and renewed, all of which and all other provisions to the contrary, we especially and expressly annul in this case, though otherwise they are to remain in full force. Given at Rome, etc., the 19th of October, 1532. Ninth Year, Blosius. End of Section 29